Tonight at 10, England gets a roadmap out of lockdown and it stretches over four months. The gradual lifting of restrictions starts in two weeks, but pubs and restaurants will not be fully open until mid-May at the earliest. All children in England will go back to school on the 8th of March, the first step on a road the Prime Minister says is irreversible. We're now travelling on a one-way road to freedom and we can begin safely to restart our lives and do it with confidence. But rules may be in place in one form and another until early summer. It's slow and steady. The government determined this lockdown will be the last. Yes, we'll have more detail and we'll be talking about the possibility of carrying vaccine passports at home and abroad. Also tonight. The first analysis in the UK of how effective the vaccines are in reality for all ages shows extremely positive results. The former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Hammond, accuses his successor and former colleague, Nicola Sturgeon, of a malicious and concerted attempt to smear him. And we look at the remarkable images of NASA's rover landing on Mars, searching for signs of any past life. And coming up in sport on BBC News, could we have fans back at Wembley in time for the climax of the European Championship? We'll be looking at the government's roadmap for sport. Good evening. Boris Johnson has unveiled his so-called roadmap for the gradual lifting of the lockdown in England, a process that starts on March the 8th. Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own separate arrangements. In England, if all conditions are met, the restrictions will all disappear by the 21st of June. The Prime Minister said there could be no such thing as a Covid-free future, but the end of the restrictions was finally in sight. So from the 8th of March, all children in England will go back to school and further education colleges will open. Residents in care homes will be allowed one regular visitor. There can be outdoor meetings in a park, for example, between two individuals. From the 29th of March, up to six people or two households will be able to meet outdoors, including in private gardens, and some outdoor sport will be allowed. From April the 12th, that's at the earliest, Shops, gyms and hairdressers will be allowed to open, plus outdoor hospitality venues such as pub gardens and theme parks. And then, no earlier than the 17th of May, cafes, pubs and restaurants will be able to open fully and restrictions on outdoor meetings for groups of up to 30 people will then be lifted. And on the 21st of June, at the earliest again, all remaining restrictions will come to an end. We'll have all the detail on ending the lockdown in England, including the possibility of introducing vaccine passports at home and abroad. But we start with our political editor, Laura Kunzberg. Instructions from Downing Street have for months made life a vague reflection of what it used to be. Going out replaced with staying in, high streets closed for business, classrooms for millions, makeshift ones at home. Tens of these. But the kitchen table will soon stop being the school desk too. Mm -hmm. Six-year-old Aidan and his mum and dad won't have to juggle their jobs with Times tables. And he can wear his new uniform at last. Your lovely new trousers, which you've not had the opportunity to wear. Mm -hmm. It would be really good for him to go back. What do you reckon? Yeah. I actually wanted to be a teacher. Thank God I didn't pick that profession because I don't think I'd be any good at it. Getting children back to school was the Prime Minister's priority, but a fast return to freedom, this is not. With every day that goes by, this programme of vaccination is creating a shield around the entire population, which means that we're now travelling on a one-way road to freedom. Whenever we ease the lockdown, whether it's today or in six or nine months, we've got to be realistic and accept that there will be more infections, more hospitalizations and therefore, sadly, more deaths, just as there are every year with flu. And thanks to the vaccinations, that there is light ahead, leading us to a spring and a summer, which I think will be seasons of hope and from which we will not go back. There will be some rules in place for another four months. When do you really hope to be able to say to the public, 
it's over. Laura, this isn't the end today, but it's very clearly a roadmap that takes us to the end and takes us uh, on a, on a one-way journey. We will be guided by uh, the data and by the progress that we make, and that's why it, it is important uh, also to be, uh, to be cautious. There'd been muted supports when, after weeks, he presented the plan to MPs. We have to tread very carefully. So I'm glad the Prime Minister spoke today of caution, of this being irreversible, of assessing the data and following the evidence. Those are the right guiding principles. And I have to say it's a welcome change. But some Conservatives want to know if the most vulnerable have been vaccinated, why not go faster? For what reason, once they've been vaccinated and protected from COVID uh, by the end of April at the latest, are, are, is there any need for restrictions to continue? We believe that the protection is very substantial, but there will be a, a, a large minority who will not have sufficient protection. In six weeks, it'll be easier to meet friends and family outdoors, accompanied by pints or food served outside from the middle of April. Shops will open their doors then too. But rules of one kind or another will be with us until at least June. There's nothing hard and fast about going back to the office or abroad, or even travelling between the four corners of the country. Clearly, we will make our own judgments about the, the particular order and the particular timing of that, because the, the data is not identical in each of the, the four nations. Today's plans are the beginning, and many businesses worry they might not make it to the end. The famous Hippodrome Casino has been forced to close for 200 days out of the last year. The boss has made 250 people redundant to try to hang on, but won't be able to open for at least another two months. Our balance sheet is now in tatters with um, a lot of debt and we've been spending a lot of time with our staff trying to help them with the sort of emotional challenges of not knowing when they can go back to work, not knowing if there's work to go back to. All of the stuff that's been done in the name of COVID has a consequence and a cost as well and it's business owners like us that are suffering. For several months the many costs of coronavirus continue to mount but the world will start soon to look more like the one we knew. Now Downing Street hopes that they've been able to get the balance just about right here between that desire to get things back to normal but still the very real risks from the disease itself. But Boris Johnson did get a bit of a hard time from some of his MPs tonight when he had a meeting with them. Some of them really frustrated about the pace of this going as they see it too slowly given all the progress that there's been with the vaccine. It's worth saying too tonight there's still some really big gaps over what might be next. No fixed date on when people will be told to go back to the office rather than stay where at home, nothing clear about how foreign travel might look by the time of summer holidays, and also the government considering the issue of whether or not we'll all have to prove we've had a vaccine before going abroad or before perhaps even doing various activities here at home. The controversial concept of a vaccine passport, that is something that the government is going to be reviewing. That said, there is a lot of de detail that we didn't have this morning, a lot of dates now in the diary, but whether in England or decisions to be taken in the next days and weeks in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales too, there are still huge things to consider for politicians in the weeks ahead and that ways that affect millions of us so profoundly. Laura, many thanks again. Laura Ginsburg with uh, her thoughts there at Westminster. Now, the first analysis in the UK of how effective the coronavirus vaccines are in reality, as opposed to in trials, shows that a single jab of the Pfizer vaccine cuts the chance of hospital admission and death by more than 75% among the over 80s. And that study was by Public Health England. A separate study in Scotland looking at both the Pfizer and Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines showed similarly positive results. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, has more details. Put your faith in this, a few millilitres of vaccine. One in three adults here already has, and that trust is being repaid. The first real-world data from the UK shows the vaccines offer strong protection for the elderly as well as younger adults. And that's you done, you've had your first vaccine. Right, thank you. We went from having no vaccine for human coronavirus disease at all, ever, to having very effective vaccines in a period of a year. That has never been done before for any other disease. 
Those vaccines, as we now know from the real world data coming out in the UK and also from Israel, are very effective in practice. Early results from England suggest that after three weeks, one dose of Pfizer vaccine reduced the risk of hospitalisation and death by at least 75% among the over 80s. A separate study in Scotland looking at the first dose of either the Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccines was similarly impressive. It found four weeks post immunisation, the risk of hospitalisation among the over 80s was cut by a combined figure of 81%. A separate study of hospital workers in England found that a single dose of the Pfizer jab cut the risk of being infected with coronavirus by more than 70%, rising to 85% after the second shot. This shows vaccines may also reduce transmission, as you cannot spread the virus if you're not infected. The vaccines being rolled out now will give a good level of protection particularly against severe disease. We think that's in the 75 to 85% ballpark um, in, in the short term. And as we get second doses and then new vaccines, that protection will only increase. The evidence on vaccine effectiveness is quite simply stunning. What matters most is keeping people out of hospital. And both the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines offer strong protection. It'll be even better after two shots so it's vital that if people are offered a jab, they turn up for both appointments. Hello, this is Take up of the vaccine has been lower among black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And a drive is underway to encourage adults of all backgrounds to come forward. Alors, ça va piquer. France, like several other European countries, does not currently recommend the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for the over 65s, citing lack of evidence of effectiveness. The data today clearly shows for the first time that the jab does provide strong protection for adults of all ages. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. So let's uh take a look at this stage at the uh, latest official figures and they show there were 10,641 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. And that means an average of 11,187 new cases recorded per day in the past week. The past 24 hours, 178 deaths have been recorded. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID test. On average, 480 deaths were announced every day in the past week. The total number of people who've died in the pandemic is 120,757. Uh, and then the vaccinations, more than 140,000 people had their first dose of a vaccine in the latest 24-hour period. Uh, it means that more than 17.7 million people have now had their first vaccination. Now, all schools and further education colleges in England will be fully open from Monday the 8th of March. Secondary school students will be regularly tested using rapid lateral flow tests. And until Easter, face coverings will be compulsory in class where social distancing is not possible. In Scotland and Wales, some younger primary school children started to return today. Our education editor, Bramwyn Jeffries, reports now from Merseyside. On anyway. Just two weeks more of this, key worker mums like Gemma dropping off, waiting for schools to go back to normal. It's about time. The kids need the routine. They need the structure to the day. And if we don't start getting back to normal soon, a whole generation of children will have massive mental health social problems that we're not going to be able to fix. That's the last one now. Thanks, Angie. From the school and a local bakery, food deliveries for parents. First stop is Tracy. Morning, Mum. You're OK? Morning. Ready for her son to go back. Thank you very much. Oh, made oh, up. Amazing. I, th I think it'd be better for the children. I think that they need to be in school lane and they need to be mixing again. They need to get back to normality. But Joanne, with four at home, told me she's less certain. If it's not safe, I'd rather they stayed off. I really would. I'd rather, I'd rather keep them at home if the time's not right for them to go back. For primary pupils, no testing. Instead, continued testing for staff to keep schools open. Secondary schools already testing staff are gearing up for pupils. So we've got uh, four desks set ready 
for testing when the students come back. Teenagers will have to do four tests on return, three at school, one at home. We think we can do about 400 students, 450 students a day maximum, uh, and do it safely and properly. And then from the Prime Minister, more detail for schools to take in. Secondary pupils will be asked to test twice a week at home. I mean, I have concerns about how we ensure that the tests at home are being done effectively and efficiently. Uh, I also worry that it's not always easy to carry such tasks out uh, at home by some parents. So how are we going to guarantee that there's consistency of approach by everybody? When these corridors start filling up, is going to rely on a lot of trust. Trust in teenagers to test themselves properly and to report the results. Because if they don't, there's nothing a school can do except appeal to their parents. Teenagers will have to wear masks, not just in corridors, but in England's classrooms too, wherever they can't socially distance. Northern Ireland has also advised masks in secondary classrooms. Their return starts with primary pupils in two weeks. In Wales, the youngest primary pupils were back today, when teenagers return a promise of testing. Scotland's youngest also back today. Across the UK, the first steps to get children's lives back to normal. Brown and Jeffries, BBC News. Well, as we've been saying, and as uh, Branwyn was uh, making clear there, arrangements in the four home nations uh, are not the same. Uh, so in a moment, we'll be speaking to our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith, and our Ireland correspondent, Chris Page. But first, let's go to Glasgow and uh, get the latest there from our correspondent, James Shaw. Yes, in the Scottish Parliament tomorrow afternoon, Nicola Sturgeon will lay out her strategic framework for coming out of lockdown. Now, she's anxious not to be pinned down on dates. She wants to be guided by the course of the pandemic. She's mentioned one date. That's the 15th of March. On that date or shortly afterwards, more Scottish schoolchildren will be allowed back into classrooms. We uh, expect that this is going to be a tiered approach. In other words, some parts of Scotland might stay with uh, tighter restrictions than other parts for at least a period of time. Nicola Sturgeon said that she wanted her approach to be sure and steady, and that meant she warned that it might be a bit slow. Wales was the first of the UK nations to go into this lockdown. It looks set to be the first to exit it too. If infection rates here keep going down, then in three weeks' time in Wales, that stay-at-home restriction will end. Non-essential retailers will get a decision on reopening their shops. Hairdressers may even be able to start trimming again. Another three weeks on at the Easter holidays, tourism may be able to start opening up again, all significantly ahead of other parts of the UK. But different things are happening at a different pace. Yes, the youngest children went back to school in Wales today, but the Welsh Government today confirmed that older pupils, some of them in secondary school years, won't go back until after those Easter holidays, causing the opposition parties here to question whether ministers have got their priorities right. In Northern Ireland, the devolved government here at Stormont is due to publish its exit strategy a week from now on the 1st of March. One date's already been set on Monday the 8th of March. Children in the first three years of primary school are due to return to the classroom. Though tonight the First Minister Arlene Foster has said she hopes that issue can be revisited. She suggested she thinks the process by which all pupils will return to face-to-face -to -face learning should be speeded up. The number of hospitalisations and deaths in this part of the UK has fallen rapidly in the last few weeks. For example, yesterday, just one person with COVID-19 was newly admitted to hospital. But all five political parties in the power-sharing coalition here agree that restrictions should be eased carefully, gradually and, they hope, permanently. Chris, many thanks. Uh, Chris Page there, instalment, uh, ending that uh, sequence for us. Well, each of the four steps for England, outlined by Boris Johnson, involves a review after four weeks and then a one-week notice period uh, to move to the next step. Uh, the earliest that businesses can open is Monday the 12th of April 
and uh, that includes all retail hairdressers and indoor gyms and hospitality if it's outdoors. Our business correspondent Sarah Corker has been gauging reaction to the announcement with businesses in the Lake District. Navigating a course out of a third lockdown was never going to be easy. On the shores of Lake Windermere, hotels and holiday parks are desperate to reopen when it's safe to do so and claw back COVID losses. Most of our income is taken between April and September in three peaks. Park Dean Resorts has 67 sites across the UK employing thousands of people. And these holiday lets and self-catering lodges are set to welcome visitors back in mid-April. Today's roadmap sets out the principles of that transition. What's your reaction? Well, whilst it's great that we've got a date to work to of the 12th of April, it's very disappointing that we're going to miss Easter for the second consecutive period that's a challenge for us uh, we missed last year's Easter and also what it causes is a knock-on delay of us being able to hire people nearly 20 million people visit the Lake District every year and tourism businesses have spent huge amounts of money making their premises COVID safe at a time when there's no money coming in and their hopes now rest on a strong bounce back this summer Outdoor socialising in beer gardens could be allowed from mid-April, but indoor hospitality in pubs, restaurants and hotels will have to wait till the month after. The landlady of the Albert pub in Bowness says they'll need continued support to get through to May. Our beer garden is one-fifth of the business, so we're going to need grants, hopefully flexi furlough or furlough in itself, um, and help with the VAT and business rates to ensure that we stay afloat. If strict conditions are met, large parts of the economy will start reopening from April the 12th, including hairdressing and retail. We're all fed up. We're all ready. You know, spring is in the air. There's a chink of light at the end of the tunnel. We're, but I'd rather not rush at it. If it needs you know, a couple of steps towards it, then we get it right this time. But for some shops, until all COVID restrictions are lifted, it may not be viable to reopen, and that could be many months away. I will have to make a call, you know, whether it's actually cost effective to actually take my staff off furlough and open the doors again, or do we wait till everything opens and we know full well that, that everyone will come back? This is a cautious unlocking as the health impacts are weighed against the continuing damage to the economy. But the Lake District is well positioned to benefit from demand for outdoor, socially distanced holidays this summer. Sarah Corker, BBC News in Windermere. Uh, watching that with me is our business editor, Simon Jackson. Voices there from the Lake District uh, in business. What are you picking up today in terms of the response? Well, I think that flushed with the success of the remarkable speed and efficacy of the vaccine rollout, there are some in the business community, as Laura was saying, like people in the back benches of the Conservative Party who think he could have gone further and could have gone faster. But on the whole, businesses are saying, if this cautious stage approach is the price we have to pay for never coming back here again, then so be it. Now, some sectors, hospitality, not going to be operating anywhere near normal for two to three months. They say they're going to need extra support. And today, the Prime Minister said they would not pull the rug away. A big spoiler alert for the budget next week, so there is more support coming, we think. Now, some would say we couldn't access support. There was no rug in the first place. But perhaps the most controversial paragraph in this whole document here is on page 40, entitled COVID status certification, where it says that vaccination data may be used to assess people's risk of transmitting the virus to others in various settings. Now, the idea of domestic vaccine passports has been dismissed in the past. We had Nadine Zahawi, the vaccines minister, saying it could be a matter between uh, businesses and their own staff. But this language seems to contemplate a wider role, getting into nightclubs maybe, getting into football stadiums. And the government says it will consider the ethical, privacy, legal and operational aspects of that approach. In other words, it's a legal minefield where it is not very clearly marked on today's roadmap, but it could become a very big feature. Indeed, Simon, thanks very much again. Simon Jack there, our business editor. Now, the former First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond, has demanded the resignation of those involved in handling the harassment complaints made against him in 2018. He was cleared last year of sexual harassment and a Scottish Government investigation into him was declared unlawful. 
And he goes on to accuse some senior individuals in the Scottish National Party of trying to expel him from public life. Mr Salmond will appear before a parliamentary committee on Wednesday and his successor, Nicola Sturgeon, says the claims have been made without a shred of evidence. Our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, is in Glasgow. Sarah, what's the significance of this latest statement that we've had? Well, these are absolutely explosive allegations from Alex Salmond against Nicola Sturgeon as well as senior officials in the Scottish Government and those at the top of the SNP. He's essentially saying that Nicola Sturgeon has lied about what she knew and when. He accuses her of misleading Parliament and of breaking the ministerial code and if that were true she would be expected to resign as the First Minister. Now, she vigorously denies these accusations, but Salmon says her account of meetings taken place between the two of them whilst he was being investigated for allegations of sexual harassment are false and manifestly untrue. And he doesn't stop there. He goes on to allege that there was a concerted effort by SNP officials and Scottish Government officials to destroy his reputation and ultimately to have him imprisoned. You'll remember that last year after a criminal trial he was acquitted of 13 counts of sexual assault. Well, earlier today Nicola Sturgeon herself spoke out. She demanded that Alex Salmon produce evidence of his claims of a conspiracy, saying she didn't think he would be able to do that because his claims aren't true. Well, Alex Salmon has submitted various documents to this Holyrood inquiry, but he complains key evidence is being blocked, he says, to protect some of the most powerful people in Scotland. We will hear more about this later in the week because Alex Salmond will appear in person to give evidence under oath in front of this Holyrood inquiry and then next week we're expecting to hear from Nicola Sturgeon herself. Sarah, once again, many thanks. Sarah Smith with the latest there for us. Let's have a little more on the easing of lockdown. The Prime Minister says that his step-by-step -step plan will uh, be led by the data and not the dates. Uh, so what are the criteria that uh, the government is using? Uh, they say the continued success of the vaccination programme will be essential, alongside evidence to show that those jabs are reducing the deaths and the number of people being admitted to hospital. It says it will also continue to assess if there's any impact from new or emerging variants of the disease in the coming months. Mr Johnson said that the NHS must not be at risk of being overwhelmed uh, by a surge in COVID infections arising from any changes that are made to the lockdown. Uh, but with many hospitals still treating similar numbers of patients as they were doing during the first stage last year, our health editor Hugh Pym has been to Milton Keynes University Hospital in Buckinghamshire to see what it's like right now for frontline staff. Oh yeah, yeah. You it takes no prisoners. Sir. Matthew, who's 79, is recovering from COVID in hospital. He had chest pains and a fall at home two weeks ago and then tested positive for the virus. You wouldn't wish it on anybody. Terrible. You feel so weak. You know, you have to rely on everybody. He was keen to tell me how grateful he was to the staff. I admire him. They've looked after you very well. Very well. No complaints. Henry, who's a consultant, and Jane, a senior sister, are reviewing COVID patients and agreeing that the pressure has eased a bit. Essentially, the, the wards have been quite busy, but we're kind of just getting over that hump now where it's starting, yes, to, starting yeah. to calm down. There are times when you know, we, we've been on our knees, but we've just kept going, and it's seeing the patients get better um, and get ready to go home that, that gives you the enthusiasm to carry on. During the surge in patient numbers in January, Milton Keynes University Hospital was one of the busiest in England. At one stage last month, more than half the adult beds in the hospital were occupied by COVID patients, over 200. Now that number's below 100, but that's still pretty close to the first peak last April. Daily COVID hospital admissions illustrate how much pressure there is across the UK. From below 100 in August, they started moving up in the autumn and increased rapidly just before the new year to hit more than 4,000 a day in January. But they've fallen steeply since then to below 1,500. 
Health service leaders say that's still a high number and the NHS will be under strain for some time. We're seeing increased pressure because of the longer term consequences of COVID, increased demand for mental health services, and of course the additional work that's generated by the vaccination programme. I think it's fair to say that the next 12 months still bring an enormous amount of additional pressure on NHS teams and services. Matthew got a round of applause as he left hospital today on his way to a rehab facility. Staff know they'll be treating many more like him, whatever happens from here. Hugh Pym, BBC News, Milton Keynes. Well, now that the uh, details of the so-called roadmap for England are being studied in more detail, um, some are concerned that the easing of the lockdown is happening too quickly, given the level of infections, while for others, the easing can't come soon enough. Our North of England correspondent Fiona Trott uh, has been uh, speaking to people in Newcastle. It's a city famous for its nightlife. <laughs> but for the people living at the heart of it, that seems a distant memory. They wanted a roadmap that came out of lockdown faster. I worked in a pub part-time to fund my university experience and pay my rent and stuff. Um, and we made it so COVID safe that I did feel like it was a safe place to be in. And now it's just frustrating that that seems to be forgotten about and they're going to be the last places to open. And it's sad for the city because it's the main part of the city. The Prime Minister just needs to remember when he was our age and what he was doing at that time. And that, that is a huge part of our lives and we don't have that anymore. And we're missing out. It's not like we can go back and like when we're 24, we'll be like, oh, we'll just pretend we're at uni again. Like, this is it. I guess for us uni students, it doesn't really make that much difference because we might be allowed to go out a bit more like in groups, but we, we do that anyway, because we live as a group. Down the river in Biker, rows and rows of houses where families have stayed indoors relatives not seeing each other and children missing their friends. Today's roadmap gives them some hope. First thing, I'll, I'll be happy to get out of the house, basically, other than shopping, of course. Uh, it'll just be good to socialise again. We need to get our lives back to normal a bit, back to normal, what does that mean, you know? Uh, you know, just to get our lives back on track a bit. At a house nearby, Julia is shielding. I want to see me grandkids, sorry. <laughs> She hasn't hugged anybody um, since Christmas and says today's announcement just, won't change her life just yet. I keep everybody at a distance. And I, I, I think it's silly. If he, if he opens it up now, we're going to go back to March. The roadmap may have been revealed, but in this part of the world, there's still caution and frustration over the route that's being taken. Fiona Trott, BBC News, Newcastle. With me is our health editor, Hugh Pym. This date of June 21st for uh, the potential easing of all restrictions in England, Hugh. Um, maybe people may have some kind of misguided understanding about that because surely the winter, months later, will bring its own challenges again. Well, yes, indeed, Hugh. I think one of the key thoughts to bear in mind is that vaccination has broken the inevitable link between rising cases, meaning rising numbers of people getting seriously ill, a certain number of them going to hospital, and sadly a certain number not surviving. Because of vaccination, a lot more people will be protected to a degree, so you can get rising cases in the next few months and beyond, but it won't have such a serious impact. Hospital admissions will be watched very closely, though, to see what happens there. But beyond June, I think what is becoming clear is that we're going to have to live with this virus for some time. The Prime Minister himself said that a Covid-free Britain, just there was no route towards that. And uh, Professor Chris Whitty made it clear he thought coronavirus was likely to be a problem this winter and for several more winters, like other respiratory diseases, like flu. Sir Patrick Vallance made the point that we may well need mask wearing to a certain degree over the winter months and maybe other social distancing measures. So although the message was vaccination is a key bedrock for moving forward, it has to be done with great caution. Hugh, once again, many thanks. Hugh Pym, there, our health editor. Right, uh, NASA has released remarkable images uh, of its space rover landing on Mars. It shows the final minutes uh, of the uh, descent last week, rather tense descent, with clouds of dust and grit being uh, blown around everywhere as the vehicle is lowered onto the floor of a crater on Mars. The rover, which is called Perseverance, uh, was sent to an ancient 
Crater Lake uh, to search for signs of past life. Our global science correspondent, Rebecca Morell, has the story. The parachute has deployed. And From the release of a supersonic parachute to the shedding of a heat shield. First look at the surface. An out of this world view, Mars has never seen before. As the rover nears the surface, the dust is kicked up. Then a change of camera as Perseverance is lowered on ropes before touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. And the landing system is jettisoned away. We can't test it on the Earth. So this is the first time we've had a chance as engineers to actually see what we designed. And uh, I just can't, it's hard for me to uh, express just how emotional it was and how exciting it was. There are new still images too, a selfie of the rover. And a vista of the alien world it now sits in, providing a glimpse of the terrain it's about to explore. Now has radar lock on the ground. This footage is already providing crucial information to scientists and they'll continue to study it as Perseverance gets to work. It's just a taste of what's to come. Rebecca Morell, BBC News. And that's it from us tonight. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.